Good afternoon, everyone. I am Chad Dietz, Metadata Librarian at Arizona State University and AZLA Professional Development Committee member. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. The AZLA Professional Development Committee provides enhanced professional development opportunities for members to increase the knowledge, skills, and abilities of library and information professionals across the state of Arizona. Before we get started, please note a few housekeeping details. Webinar participants are in listen-only mode. Please post your questions anytime during the presentation in the chat at the bottom of your screen. To ask questions anonymously, you can submit them directly to the hosts and panelists using that option instead of submitting to everyone. You can turn on live transcript and, show, and choose show subtitles in your Zoom window for closed captioning. The session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Arizona Library Association YouTube channel. A link will be provided in your follow-up email. Uh, Cheryl Gerken will be your technical director today. You can contact her via the chat if you're having technical issues during the webinar. And if you are able to hear the sound now, but unable to hear the sound during the webinar, please dial in using the phone number provided in your registration confirmation email. At the end of the webinar, we ask that you complete a simple evaluation survey. The estimated time to complete the survey is two to three minutes. Please take the time to complete it as we use the data to improve our offerings to you and your feedback is important to us. I'd also like to encourage library staff of all levels to consider becoming an Arizona Library Association member. Among other things, your membership enables AZLA to provide professional development opportunities such as this one to library staff across Arizona. Visit www.azla.org for additional information. The Professional Development Committee is seeking proposals for upcoming webinars. If you have expertise in library science that you think would help other libraries and librarians, please consider applying to be a webinar presenter. You will find a link in your webinar follow-up email. The Professional Development Committee would also like to invite you to the next program in our monthly webinar series brought to you by us. There will be, there will not be, um, oh, sorry. Uh, on December 14th, you can join us for Storytime Huddle, the fun and fundamentals of Storytime with Aubrey White. Are you new to leading story time or have you been doing story time for a while and feel like you need to shake things up? If so, this webinar is for you. Librarian Aubrey White will share his best tips and tricks for a successful story time. Based on Phoenix Public Library Story Time 101 curriculum, this training will include best practices based on early childhood development, the importance of diversity and inclusion in our stories, and the six early literacy skills our youngest patrons need as they get ready to read plus a dive into the most important techniques to use in any type of story time. Let's build those early literacy muscles. Uh, registration for this webinar is posted to the AZLA calendar, the Arizona State Library calendar, and advertised in the monthly professional development email blast. A link will also be provided in your webinar follow-up email. So thank you so much for attending today, and please join me in welcoming Jean Kilker, Samantha Anderson, and Julianne Chang for their presentation, Voracious Readers Read Again. So Jean, Samantha, and Julianne, take it away. Well, hello everyone. I'm delighted to talk with you today and thank you to the team supporting me here as I talk about different ways to have teen book groups, but I've also changed it to make sure I'm including all grade levels. So hopefully um, you'll be with me and Julianne and the team from Arizona Humanities. Um, as we go through this program with you. Jean, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I think right now you're sharing um, your presenter mode instead of the, the screen. Okay, let's change that. Thank you. It did it again. We practiced it before. 
And thank you, Julianne. Did that work? Awesome. All right, thank you. Therefore, audience, see why I need a team with me. So let me go to our the objectives I have for you today. Um, I'm going to talk about my current book club and how to advertise, promote, get partnerships and funding and sources for more ideas. I wanted to go over the history because this program that I've done in my school library has changed over the last 10 or 12 years. It started out very simply with just a book and its movie. On a game night, so a football game night, I'd do a movie in the library and have books available that were based on the movie. Then with an English teacher, we moved to using the One Book Arizona books which um, I've got some listed there. And then we also did the National Endowment for the Arts, The Big Read. We started calling it um, Voracious Readers just as a, a promotion to read a lot. We also were privileged to be able to take kids to a lot of field trips just because we liked them too. And we figured, well, we'll go and we'll take kids with us. Then voracious readers turn to going to the theater and we'd look in internet movie database, see what was being released, get the books and take the kids on the field trip. Then of course came the pandemic, that stopped that. And then I scrambled to have the book club online. So there's some information for you here but that was quite an adventure to do that. Let's move on. Currently, The Voracious Readers happens in my school library. I have a partnership with You'll Learn About, and um, I choose five titles with the movie to go with them. Last year, the five titles are on the screen. And each of the books was set or had something to do with a country. I partnered with Culinary Arts, who made snacks, plus I was able to buy snacks of the country. Here are five students holding up those five books in my library. Of course, teenagers, so they're right in front of their faces. But they all enjoyed those titles last year. And we're continuing this year, as you'll see in a minute. The five genres for this year are romance, murder mystery, sports, dystopian novel, and fantasy. Now, I did not want it to be another English class. It had to be fun um, and energetic for the kids. The culinary arts, again, has volunteered to um, make pizza this year with, um, I get the supplies for them. We've had some serendipitous occurrences. So Grand Canyon University put on the play Murder on the Orient Express. And I was uh, able to take the students to see that. And then our um, book next week is Death on the Nile. So they were excited. I do online discussion, which I'll come to. And as I mentioned, not to be another English class, but just to pull in their prior knowledge from English about foreshadowing or the elements of a romance. So when we are together about a month later for the movie in the library, we discuss, or I bring out what they've written in the chat, and we discuss if these things are happening in the movie also. So that's a screenshot of my whiteboard where we're discussing that. The setup. So any book club needs advertising. I We do teams at my school. And so I do flyers, school announcements. I put it on the web page. 
And then just because teachers like to read too, I tell a lot to the other teachers about what we're doing and they'll come also read the book and participate with the kids for the discussion. A good number is 10, but this year it's just been growing. So I'm up to 14 participants that are constantly asking me questions about the book, not even in the chat that we're using, but they're excited for all of this. It's been very, very popular. Another thing to do is get on the school calendar because the um, it's, I don't know if you can hear that, but today in our announcements and bell changes, it's for Veterans Day, but I'll keep talking. Um, so you want to avoid homecoming or academic decathlon or anything that will um, interrupt what you want to do. So be sure to look at the school calendar. Here's one of the very simple posters that I put in our teams. They don't have to be fancy. I mean, some people are probably way more um, artistic than I am, but it's the consistency. So I post all the time. Something's going on for a whole month ahead of the movie. And even it's doubled up because the movie and book we're reading now I'm already advertising the next one. So it's just the consistency and continuation of advertising, advertising, advertising. And um, I'm in a very large school. So to get that note out to everybody does take that persistence. already that teachers will help you. They like that. Um, the counselors or social workers can be invited to come talk to students during the discussion if they've participated. And then it's a uh, instance in the book that they would have some expertise in. We've done it where we've partnered parents and their students to read a book. We did that with One Book Arizona with the two books about the Grand Canyon. One student and another each read those two books or a teacher and a student or a parent and a student. So that's a possibility too to bring in your community. I also like to always include as many clubs and classes as I can. So art department to do bookmarks, um, Again, as I'm uh, collaborating with culinary arts, performance, if they wanna do a reader's theater for a section of the book, there's a lot of opportunities to collaborate with others in your school. Discussion questions online range from serious questions Again, trying to solicit background information of what the kids have learned in English class. Um, and some are just funny questions or silly questions. And then some are, of course, um, projections. Who do you think is the murderer? Who do you think is going to be stuck and not go with the group? So some are very light questions and some are more sophisticated. These are some of my student responses. Some of the more um, heartfelt novels, of course, they felt deeply like Ashes in the Snow about the Lithuanian situation long ago. And Ruth Zepetis' books are all on historical fiction. Um, I'll explain in a minute about getting the movies though. These are my challenges. And that's what I was just mentioning. It's so difficult to get a book that they want to read and choose something and then find a YA book with a movie to go with it. And then now, of course, as always, the books and the movies have to be approved for use. So nothing too terribly controversial. And we do have the new legislation. Then another challenge is many of our best readers are in lots of activities at school. So 
even when I choose a date, I'll have one student and she can't come because it's a sports event that she needs to be at. So the dates are flexible. You also might in an elementary school setting do a read aloud instead, or perhaps do it over multiple lunch times rather than after school. How did I get the books? Well, right now I have this wonderful partnership you'll hear about, but there's other ways to get it. Um, like donors choose if you have a book fair and they give you money to get what you want. Um, classroom libraries. Now I started out that we just use library books. The students get didn't get to keep them. We just solicited books out of classrooms and other schools in our district until I had enough, enough for them to use. A mention at the bottom of this screen is these do not have to be current because this year's students will not have read a YA book that came out maybe five years ago and does have a movie to it. How do I get the movies? Well, be sure you follow district policy, G for elementary or only PG in grade 12. Um, read everything and watch everything first. And then you can also do grants and partnerships. Now, what I have, which is wonderful, 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 is this partnership with Arizona Humanities. They purchased the books for me. I chose the books. They've sent me the 10 copies each of the five titles. They have sent me or I buy them and get reimbursed for the movie adaptation of each title and then funding our uh, reimbursement for any of the foods that we've done. And I just put some of those, if you like that cultural one, some of the markets I used on this slide. Now I'm going to turn it over to Julianne and Samantha because they will want to also brag about their wonderful program. So let me not share, stop share. All right. Okay, thank you so much, Jean. Um, I just want to say, first of all, thank you to Jean and to Arizona Library Association just for having us. We're so excited to be here and to be able to share this fantastic program for you um, or to you. I am Samantha Anderson. I'm the Grants Manager for Arizona Humanities, and I'm joined by my um, colleague, Julianne Chang, our Programs Manager. And we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, introduction into who we are. Um, so a lot of people don't know who we are. We do kind of fly under the radar a little bit. Um, and then Julianne will kind of take over with a little bit more about our AZ Reads program. And then we'll kind of finish with just some timelines, how what, what's coming up. So first of all, we are Arizona Humanities. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, but we are also the state affiliate for the National Endowment for the Humanities. So we're actually one of 56 um, state humanities councils. There's one in every state and territory in the U.S. So just know if you're joining us from outside of Arizona, you do have a council um, in your, if you're joining us from the United States, in your um, in your state or territory. They won't have an easy reach program necessarily, but they do have fantastic resources that are tailored to their area. So just know that. Um, we support public programs um, that promote understanding of the human experience with cultural, educational, and nonprofit organizations across Arizona. Our, our work is rooted in partnerships with organizations statewide. Next slide. So our mission is to build a just and civil society by creating opportunities to explore our shared human experiences through discussion, learning, and reflection. So we are rooted in the humanities. That definition is traditional definitions are like liberal arts. So English is definitely one of them. Um, art history, archaeology, history, jurisprudence, ethics, philosophy, all of that. But we really like to expand that definition. We see the humanities as the way we explore the human experience. 
The stories and ideas help us reflect upon who we are as individuals and as members of a global society. Many of our programs focus on civic education, environmental humanities, humanities recovery issues, and so on. So you really combine the humanities with a lot of different things as a way to create that context around an idea. All, all programs that we support have interactive components that allow the public to engage that discussion, learning, and reflection, whether it's through Q&A between a speaker and an audience or facilitate community conversation. All the programs that we support, support should stimulate community exchange. And I really appreciate in this program in particular, you know, it's not just about reading the book. It's about experiencing that story through other media and other methods of storytelling. Um, it's about partnering, like she said, with, um, you know, with the culinary um, groups, as well as performances and arts and music. And that's also most importantly, kids engaging with each other around these stories. So next all right, so it's just a little snapshot about some of the things we do, and then we're gonna get into a very, very special program that we have. So we primarily function through our grants and through our programs. So we do have traditional grant programs, including our project libraries are eligible to apply to. Those will be very kind of your more typical grant experience of an application, a panel process, things like that. We're gonna go into a program that's really, really special because it's more of a hybrid between our grants and our programs in a way that you can actually um, receive funding and support in a way that is maybe just not as complicated as our grants can be. So go ahead and move it over to Julianne. Thank you, Samantha. And so if any of you are joining us from community libraries, you might be familiar with some of our public programs like AZ Speaks and Frank Talks, um, but we do have a new program that started, I guess it's not as new, it's maybe a couple years old now, it's Easy Reads. This is our K-12 partnership program. And as Samantha and Jim have kind of mentioned, this is not a traditional grant. It's a program partnership. And that allows a lot of flexibility in the application process, but also how we implement the program with you. So um, it allows us to streamline the application for you. Jane can probably talk a little bit more about that simpl simplification of the application and her experience with it. And it also allows us to meet with everyone who sub submits an application. And that really gives us an op opportunity for Samantha and I to meet with everyone face-to-face, -face, so to speak, in Zoom and learn a little bit more about your program and your community and your students. And that's all factored into the decision-making process. Um, we also, through our discussions with teachers and school librarians, um, found that the best way to get funding to you, especially if you're at a school, is sometimes to directly purchase the resources that you need. So that means we are purchasing the books on your behalf. Um, we can contract with visiting authors. Um, you know, we can help pay admission fees for field trips, but we can do that directly through Arizona Humanities. And so when Jane was mentioning we bought the books, we, we actually did order the books through the Phoenix Book Company. So we can, you know, supply your books through a local book vendor, which we love to do. Um, but this just allows for a little more flexibility in how the funding is dispersed. It makes a little things a lot faster and easier for both sides. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like the nuts and bolts of why it's a program partnership. That flexibility is built in. Um, and it also gives us an opportunity, depending on, you know, how you want to form your program, but it helps us um, pinpoint resources or speakers for you as well, if that's something that you need extra support with. Um, what we do always say, though, is that the program is something that the applicant is designing. So you all are the experts of your libraries, and you know how to work with your students. So often the idea the program proposal is being formed by you all, you submit the application, and if there's any additional support needed, any connections you need us to help you make, we can do that. Um, we are here to support, and that is because it's that program partnership again. And that second bullet point you'll see that we fund up to $2,500 um, with an um, larger, like a school-wide book club or something like that. We can have a discussion about increasing that budget. Um, so there is some flexibility there. And we do ask if you are applying and asking for more funds to let us know so we can have that conversation. The 2,500 is kind of the ballpark, ballpark area of what we, we do fund for programs. And let's talk a little bit about funding literacy in the humanities. So Samantha gave us a great definition of the humanities. It's very expansive to include not just the liberal arts, but also the idea of storytelling and narrative and you know, community experiences. That's all part of the humanities. 
Um, so when we think about this, um, we do encourage programs that are engaging in reading, but also in the humanities. And that can be incorporating history, it can be incorporating cultural studies, it can even be book clubs in other languages outside of English too. So things don't have to be limited to one language. Um, we are also interested in programs that intersect with STEM and the humanities as well. We do fund some of those programs. So if you're a library that is looking to incorporate some of your STEM programs along with a reading program, that's something that we're also open to as well. Um, so again, there's a lot of flexibility in the kinds of programs we can fund. The important thing is something that Samantha mentioned, and that is the engagement. So we're not just, you know, supplying a book for a kid. We want to make sure that there's activities happening around that book. So it could be a book club model off of something like Voracious Readers, where we're getting a lot of engagement in different formats um, with the kids, and they're learning from each other, and they're having different experiences, whether online or in person for the movie nights. But there needs to be some kind of activity happening with the program. Um, finally, you'll see your priority given to underserved populations. So when we do look at applications, we do give special consideration to um, Title I schools and schools that are serving traditionally underserved communities. And right now, I'd like to direct you to our website. I think it's linked in the chat. And that'll give a longer definition of what we mean by underserved communities. Um, but that is a priority. Although we invite everyone to apply, um, we do look through all the applications. And you can always put in the application the kind of students that you're working with. Um, so it is open to all K-12 school libraries and community libraries if you're working with kids. So I want to talk a little bit more just about the different types of literacy programs that we fund. Um, so we are looking for reading and discussion programs. Again, that can be book clubs like Voracious Readers, and book clubs can take many different forms. Um, we have partnered on numerous book clubs with different school libraries as well as community libraries. And sometimes that involves purchasing books for kids and adults to keep. And we've um, just had some feedback from some of our partners that when you know the kids get to keep the book, they are really invested in reading it. Um, so that's something that we do like to provide. Sometimes along with those books, as it can be virtual, but it can also be in person too, especially if they're a local author. And Arizona Humanities can help contract directly with that author. We can put you in touch if we do know the author that you are trying to work with. But you know, reading and discussion programs, again, can look very different. They can be book clubs. We work with school libraries that do library expansion programs where they're focusing on a certain genre or theme. So graphic novels are very popular. We've had school libraries um, kind of expand their graphic novel library offerings, but also do um, activities around that with the kids, asking them about what they read, having them write book reviews, things like that. Um, we've had school libraries expand upon a theme like families and culture. So expanding the definition of family through reading books about what a family can look like, um, having story time with the kids. Um, so it can really, you know, just depend on what your what your audience is and what the needs of your library is. Um, so that's just one idea. We fund programs in storytelling and creative writing. So that can be, you know, inviting an author into your class library to do a writing workshop. It can be inviting different guest speakers, um, you know, poets, artists into the library to talk with your students, depending, of course, on the format of how your school library works or your community library works. Um, we do a lot of programs that, again, foster that peer-to-peer -peer learning and discussion. It is really important for the students to be able to talk to each other and learn from each other, whether that's happening through a book club or an author visit or a workshop. Um, and through all that, there's often cultural learning and sharing, you know, and that can take many forms. Um, that can be bringing in, you know, more culturally diverse books into your library, your class library or your community library that reflect maybe some of the kids' experiences. Um, so, that's something that we do. We can talk more about that. Um, but really, again, the programs are really diverse. We're very flexible in the types of programs we fund, but that's kind of just a little bit of an overview of different types of programs that we are looking at. And we're happy to take questions after this too if you have specific questions. Okay, so we're just going to uh, take a real quick look on our upcoming deadlines for AZ Reads. We will be opening our fund. Um, applications for our funding period starting June 1st of 2024, which will go through June 1st of 2025. So that is the funding period. Those applications will open on February 1st. The deadline for submissions will be March 15th. Um, 
And then just so you know, as we receive these applications, we start in, you know, with, within about a week, we're going to be talking to you about scheduling that Zoom phone call so or Zoom meetings. So that way we can take that time to not only read your application, but also get to know you and be able to do that in a timely manner so that we can kind of make sure we're working through all of the applications. So just know as you submit the application, we'll be in touch with you maybe like seven to maybe 15 days, kind of and actually get to know you. So the application process, it is extremely pared down. Um, it's really just to get the basics of your program, an idea of who your students are and what your goals are in a, a very brief budget. Um, just to be kind of know where we're that jumping off point during that conversation. Um, next, we have that Zoom meeting. We meet together. We usually, um, we set aside an hour. Sometimes it takes 30 minutes. Sometimes it takes a full hour. It really just depends. But that's our time to get some more information about your program, make sure we, we fully understand it. And it's also a really important time. It's time where if we actually have any major questions or concerns, we can address them right away during the application process. As the grants perseverers on humanities, that is just so amazing to me, just because there's so many applications that are wonderful that we get, but maybe there's one big question and that means we can't fund it. It's just a no. Now there's like, oh, we have one big question. We can ask that question. We can get that information and we can make sure that you know, the program meets guidelines and not just say, no, I'm sorry, you have to wait till next year. We can take care of that during that application process. So just so you know, that is the um, general um, timeline. We will have an information session as we get closer to those dates. We'll have that um, scheduled out as well. And so please just, uh, if you'd like to join our listserv on our website, you can, if you go to azhumanities.org. And again, um, our AZ Humanities or AZ Reads program as well have more information. We did have a question. Can we go ahead and answer that now or? Sure, if you'd like to. Okay. <laughs> um, I just had, I just saw one about um, a partnership, um, but participants are not in the K through 12 educational system. So it sounds like it's, yeah, so it's, it's adults um, with IDDs. So unfortunately through this program, we will not be able to fund it since this is specialized for the K through 12, um, for those K through 12 programs, but you can go to our traditional grants for something like that. So we do, it looks like you do partner with a nonprofit. Um, so they can actually apply for the funds as well. If it's harder for you to apply for the funds, they can apply for the funds as well. And we have our project grants as well as our mini grants. Depending if it meets guidelines, I mean, this may be a good um, application for a mini grant, which is also kind of more of a simplified application process than our project grants as well. So um, if you'd like to get in touch with me, please let me know. I can get you that information. Okay, um, sorry. sorry, when you said get in touch with Samantha, um, use your contact information up here, and we really encourage you to give us a call or email us if you have not even just happy to kind of talk to you about it. If you want to bounce ideas off of us, we are more than open to that. We can schedule a meeting before the application opens. So definitely encourage you to reach out to us. And then we had one more question of, can a district lead library media specialist apply? Or um, does it have to be an individual campus? Um, we've had both. So we've had individual campuses apply and we've had someone more at the district level apply. That's fine either way, both work. I think that was it. If I missed any, sorry, we'll get back. We'll find them. <laughs> Is it my turn again yet? All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. All right. So let me share my screen again. And I'll probably need some help from my friends. All right, I'm going to brag again about this program. I have had grants otherwise, and it is so much paperwork 
and so much bugging the district office and chasing things down and hoping things show up when you need them. And this has been absolutely painless. The um, grant gets everything right to me right away. They will arrange things for you. This is such a wonderful opportunity for anyone for K-12 schools or programs. So I wanted to also just bring up that sometimes you do not want to stay late. Um, just things happen or the buses for the kids or whatever. I did mention that perhaps this could be during lunchtime instead, but you can also perhaps want to do some sort of craft or activity with the students. I have some listed here, and I did mention about bringing in other groups to do readers theater or to act out skits, or perhaps um, a dance program might want to create some sort of uh, visual for the kids, or you can do readers theater with the kids with the book that you're reading. So we know with our teens that it's not a big deal to stay later and keep them after school. But for others, you might want, but this has been so successful. It's just been wonderful. And then hopefully um, I've had some highlighted pieces here throughout this presentation that um, you've been able to contribute things that you know for everyone else also. Here are some discussion sites. There are not many that I listed, but there are plenty of them online. You can always find discussions online. Sometimes the books come with a, a discussion questions at the back. Uh, I have a program called Teaching Books, and that gives a lot of resources to different books. And then of course, ALA, has their lib guides, and NEA also has uh, book club information, as well as many other places. But those were just four that I thought I would um, add here to this slide. Then we also do some sort of award for participation for all the students. This is actually our top reader award that we use in our libraries but I've adapted it to give the kids recognition for the Voracious Reader program. It's easy enough and you probably have some sort of recognition of certificate already, but it's pleasing to the kids. Not only are they participating, but then they're recognized for their participation. And I make another copy, one goes to the student, and another is um, up in the library on the wall so that anyone who comes in, they can see the certificate for those kids who have participated. And that's certainly easy enough to do. Then I did uh, want to talk about some sources for what I use for this presentation and um, other places to get information. Now, I went out to other public libraries, this top one, just to see what their book clubs were. And throughout the years, that's what I've done. I've gotten ideas from everyone everywhere. We, um, I partnered with Phoenix Public Library a couple of times for books. Grand Canyon Reader Award titles is a function of Arizona Library Association. I chair the teen committee, but there are many committees. So there's different levels of books, and that's a great way to find a book that's already been vetted by your fellow library teacher librarians. And then I put my... I also am the chair of the teacher librarian division for Arizona Library Association and would be super happy to answer any of your questions about any of this program for voracious readers. 
there are books that help teacher librarians or um, youth librarians with ideas for book clubs. This one is one that I just happen to still have, the Teen Centered Book Club from Libraries Unlimited, but there are many more. And then One Book Arizona, uh, there's through the State Library, Arizona State Library, has the list of those book titles that we um, used some time ago. It built up to the centennial, but some of those are wonderful stories and have movies to go with them also. So I'm ready for if any of you have questions for me or for Arizona Humanities, if any others come up, please ask. And I think Chad's going to monitor that. Yes, so we do still have plenty of time. Thank you so much, Jean, Samantha, and Julianne. Um, if you if there are more questions, do please uh, submit them in the chat and we will get to them. Uh, thank you to Samantha and Julianne for, for answering a couple of them already. We have had another one come in. Uh, the, the direct question was, is it a year-long program? But just to expand on that a little bit, I wonder if Samantha or Julianne or Jean, any of you, uh, what is the process like after that initial meeting as far as the, the communication back and forth between the two of you? How long are you all involved? And sort of the general time frame. Why don't you talk about it and then I'll just tell my experience afterward. Okay, Sam, I'll go first and you jump in if I'm forgetting anything. So um, after we meet, um, you know, the deadline passes and then um, Samantha and I and the rest of the Arizona Humanities staff review the applications and consider the discussions we have in our interview. We do try to have a decision made pretty quickly, at least within a month of the deadline notification. Um, and that is also because um, we do have a um, contract process. We will need a memorandum of understanding or an MOU that will be signed between Arizona Humanities and your school or your, your library branch. Um, just confirming the details of the program to make sure the administration is informed of what's happening in the, in the classroom library or in that particular library. So that MOU process, um, you know, it depends on your administration. It can be very quick. Like, um, you know, sometimes it's just a couple of days of, of principal signing off on it. Um, require, you're required to send it up to your school board that it can be a process and a little bit of back and forth on terms, but we are more than happy to work with your administration in, you know, adapting the MOU to fit the terms that your school board might require, as long as everyone's like on the same page about the program happening. Um, but, you know, we'll still make the program happen. So just know that we work with you on the MOU process. It's nothing scary. Um, the reason that we have this in the spring is so that all the ducks are in a row for when the actual program starts happening, either in June or in the fall when that school year starts. Um, to answer the year long question, it kind of depends on the program. So some programs are a year long. So the Voracious Reader programs is happening throughout the year. Um, some programs that we do fund are a one time thing. So there's an author visit coming to a library and that happens once. Or it can be a semester where the kids are reading one book that semester and then they have a workshop at the end. So the length of a program just depends on what you plan for. Maybe. And oh. go ahead. I was just gonna say the one thing I would add is at the very end of the program, um, your program specifically, we would then have more of like a final report process like you would for a typical grant, but we are very flexible on this as well. Um, you could write up a, a formal report for us if you would like, if that's how you prefer. Or we could do more of like, um, more like the Zoom meeting in the beginning where we can do an actual meeting and go over the questions, have to be more of a discussion between ourselves, um, just how the program went. We will collect a few pieces of, of information, how many students um, participated, you know, things like that. But it's really, that's really more of a discussion again, and we're taking notes and that's how we collect that final report. So there is kind of a reporting process after, but again, it's flexible and we try to work with you on what style of reporting works best for you. So I saw this in an email and I'm always interested in looking for some help for doing programs that I'd love to do with our, our students because of our student population. 
And this was painless. It was amazing. Of course, I was nervous when they said, well, we're going to call you to interview you. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Okay. But I wrote up, there's the form, um, the application, and they called. And of course, there, as you can see, they're just wonderful to work with. And then I was, oh, I actually um, didn't ask for very much money. And so um, Julianne said, well, you know, books keep going up in cost. We'll move this up a little bit for you, which was terrific. Um, you know, who does that? So it was painless. I chose the books. I act, I did, though, ask them to go through Phoenix Book Company. Through this whole yeah. process with local vendors to help with Arizona economy. Um, so the books last year and this year came from Phoenix Book Company. And then, um, as you'll see when you get the slide deck, that I use local markets that for the most part were independently owned. Um, so that's what I thought would be a good partnership for the school also is to use our local people. Then, yes, it went through the whole year, every other month approximately because there were five books and five movies. Now I must say though, I did, um, order the movies on Amazon, um, but got the receipts, sent them. It was, I could send each receipt if I wanted to send them one at a time, or I could gather the receipts and just send a bulk. I mean, that was like amazing. Um, if you've done any other grants, you do not have that flexibility, nor do you have that support. So the movies came that way. Um, I must say the first year we ran into a problem because of a book I chose before the legislature. So they were just gracious. Oh yeah, we'll change the book. And I just got a different book and I hadn't gotten the movie yet. So that worked out just fine. Um, I can't say enough of, of how wonderful this is and that um, that's why I wanted them here with this presentation because you got all that great information. It's easy and fun. I love it. I have a good time with the kids. And then as the teacher librarian, yes, you have your library mice kids who are always there, but this has brought in, as I said, I'm in a big school. This has brought in kids that I really didn't know. And now I have a lot more personal contact with different kids also. So I know I did go through the slide deck quite quickly um, because there was a lot on each slide. Um, remember, all this is adaptable, as they were also saying. They're looking for the interaction with kids. The cultural scuff was was wonderful. They This year they're asking, well, what are they going to have to eat? And um, of course, the pizza is really good too. So there's no complaints there. Um, you know, the cautions on always read and always watch ahead of time what you want to do. And then um, the after school. So our kids being teenagers, that's not a problem here. But I hopefully gave you some different uh, ways to make this sort of thing. Jean, could you talk a little bit about, have you already had thoughts for next year? You know, you said you keep getting bigger every year. So as this just continues to get bigger and bigger, you know, what, uh, how far ahead are you planning for the following year? Would you consider splitting it into two groups if it gets too big? Just in general, have you had thoughts about moving forward with it? Um, it works well. I mean, we are practiced in my district that we run entire classes of 36 through a teams. So the discussion part, I mean, we're just all used to that here, that you have questions and discussions and you have a lot of kids. Um, usually a book group, you want 10 to 15 because you're just meeting in a, a classroom uh, and want everybody to have participation. But with the asynchronous part of the discussion being online, there's not a problem with a lot of kids doing it. 
So the more the merrier and the more the better. And as word spreads, I, I'm hoping it just keeps growing and growing. For next year, again, as I said, the biggest problem is getting those teen books with the movie that are acceptable. So I haven't started investigating yet. The kids this year, the few that didn't graduate or, or came back, they love the cultural piece. So I was thinking of doing something different, but also, in, I mean, same book, um, the movie, but choosing some other cultural aspect. We've done... Um, lots of things we've been involved in like keep how projects with other countries we've done um games that go with other countries um that they play there and having those so i haven't put it together yet i'm just thinking of all sorts of ideas that would bring they that cultural aspect back to it they like this they like the books they loved um uh, if i stay that's a, a weeper so um, they, they enjoyed that one. Um, they love the pizza because our culinary arts group is terrific. But um, yeah, move on, give them something different. I think it would be a four-year cycle, um, actually, because then my teens would have graduated and then the new group wouldn't have done the same thing, perhaps. Um, but we'll see. I don't know. I haven't gotten that far yet. No, that's great. Thank you. Uh, we did have a question come through for you, uh, Jean. Uh, if, uh, how did you market it to students who were reluctant to participate specifically? Um, the students, teachers, so oh. all the English teachers and all the reading teachers, we are a large school, they all know this. And then they have suggested students too. And so I have that partnership with the teachers to also identify students that they know like to read, but might be the more quiet student who doesn't want to come to some strange committee or meeting where kids they don't know. But um, so it's an individual contact. So the teacher suggests the student, tells me the student's name. I find the student to meet with them or identify them uh, otherwise. And, um, you know, that's a growing experience for our teens to, to volunteer yourself to go to something where you might not know everybody. So that partnership helps a lot. Awesome. We did have another question come in. Did you know that Grand Canyon was gonna be performing the play or were you able to reach out to the AZ Humanities Group afterwards um, and say that you wanted to include it? No, that didn't even cost anything. That was like amazing. Um, here in the library, I do have two classrooms. I used to teach creative writing and the teacher who's teaching creative writing right now got a message from Grand Canyon University about uh, the Orient Express play and that they were willing to send a bus and take kids to that play. So she told me and I said, okay, we're all going too. So it was just a happenstance that that did that. Other years, and so we went and they loved it. And Grand Canyon funded all that. It was just a, a great day. But other years, um, an English teacher and I are just, I have to say adventurous. So we were always, um, we can get vans and we have to have the driving uh, permissions and go through that training. But we took kids to Glendale Public Library for a jazz night because it went with a book. We took kids to the Phoenix Art Museum for Fahrenheit 451. The graphic artist was there. Um, it's just your comfort level with running around, but I love taking kids places and exposing them to whatever we can do. And so did my teacher partner. That's fantastic. I love the community tie-in. Um, it seems like such a three-dimensional experience, right? Because you're reading, you're watching, but you're also out in there experiencing parts of it. I, I think that's really great. Uh, we did have a follow-up question from before, and it, uh, it's from Chrissy. What about kids who don't read? 
What about the non-readers? Well, the non-readers on reading and trying to get all our students to read all the time. So I, besides this, I mean, this is just a program for kids who want to read these novels, see the movie, whatever. But I have classes all day. I bring um, classes into the library. Um, there's always something that they'll read. It just depends on the hook that you propose to them. Um, I do. We do lots of graphic novels. We do a lot of um, very low level reading. But for instance, the series Carter High is maybe 26 pages long, but it's all about high school students. So I have a lot of opportunities for that I work with the teachers. It's very collaborative here on providing um, the right books for the right kids. Um, I did mention in the um, presentation that I do have a program called Teaching Books. And it has book trailers, it has author interviews, it has, you know, why you should read this book. Um, I don't know, I could go through a hundred things, um, providing lists for students on genres um, and talking to kids individually. What did you read last? And getting them a book and talking it up. Oh, I went to a conference and that presenter said, this was the best boys book ever. Try it and see if you'll like it. So, you know, there, there's ways to encourage reading. And so we do that a lot, but it's not just me. Um, the whole school's focused on bringing up our reading skills of our students. And of course, for some teachers, it's required reading, so they have to read. Thank you so much. Um, we are just about at time. We've got about three minutes to go. So Jean, uh, Samantha, Julianne, any final parting thoughts you want to share before we wrap up? And uh, just real quick, uh, participants, you can send a couple more questions in the chat if you still have them. We will be providing them to the panelists after this is over. And if anyone needs help, please ask. Um, I, I have my email there. and. Um, that's what I tell the kids. They're doing their research projects. And I say, wait a minute, half the kids are emailing me about where's the answer for this? Why not you too? So please ask if you have questions. And thank you everyone for participating and listening and being here. And Julianne and Samantha, this is wonderful. I can't brag enough about the programs that you oh I just wanted to thank Jean for being a wonderful partner you're a, pretty much a model partner staying in communication with us all the time um we love your program and we want to thank you for inviting us to talk today and uh, also thank the Arizona Library Association for having us yeah, thank you all. Um, it seems like a very syner synergistic partnership that has been very successful. So we're we're thrilled to to have it here. All right. Well, uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you all for being with us here today. Uh, as a reminder, you will receive an email with a link to the recording of this webinar. Um, and we hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, everyone.